Hi, this is Tzvi Rosen. Welcome to another lecture in the series on history of calculus. And today we're going to talk about a key figure, Sir Isaac Newton. And the reason he's a key figure is because together with Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, they are regarded as the fathers of calculus or the inventors of calculus. Um, Sir Isaac Newton was working in England. Uh, he, was, he lived from 1643 to 1727, and uh, Leibniz lived in Germany between 1646 and 1716. And uh, they were very active in the second half of the 17th centuries. But before we get into their invention of the calculus, it's important to remember what is it that we think of when we talk about the calculus, and how much of that did they actually invent? So in an earlier lecture, we discussed um, d uh, different components of the calculus. And uh, let's consider how much calculus was in the air when uh, Newton and Leibniz arrived on the scene. Uh, so there are first limits, derivatives, integrals, transcendental numbers, in particular numbers that are defined as limits, and uh, there's infinite series. Those are the, the primary parts of the calculus as we think about it today. So let's think about what's been done up to that point. Well, in terms of limits, Newton and uh, there, there's been a, a notion of things approaching infinity or approaching some point in the past. Even Archimedes and the other Greeks had this concept, at least in spirit, but Newton and Leibniz didn't even invent uh, a rigorous definition for a limit. So that, that, that had to wait until Cauchy in the 1800s. And so when we talk about limits, um, we're really not, that's not what Newton and Leibniz are being credited with. Okay, well, how about derivatives? Uh, we can consider uh, the fact that Archimedes computed some tangents to curves and other geometric objects. Um, but even before Newton and Leibniz formalized the definition of derivative, Fermat had already come around and uh, invented this difference quotient that we think of when we talk about a limit, where you take f of a plus e minus f of a and divide it by e, and then you set e to zero after simplifying. So this can be also, like, what's missing here is taking the limit as e approaches zero, but as we said, there's not really a precise notion of a limit here. But this is something that Fermat did and published before either Newton and Leibniz. So they shouldn't really be given credit for inventing the derivative. How about integrals? Well, we've seen examples of quadratures in these lectures uh, since antiquity. People wanted to compute areas underneath curves and volumes, and those are also done using the techniques of integration. And even the relationship between integrals and derivatives, which is known as the fundamental theorem of calculus, that also can't be claimed uh, solely by Newton and Leibniz, because that was proved in some form by Isaac Barrow. And he was the Lucasian professor of mathematics before Newton, uh, in many ways Newton's mentor. And he had like a geometric version of the fundamental theorem. There's an image describing his proof from a, a book on the historical development of the calculus. Um, so, so Barrow had already gotten to some version of the fundamental theorem. Okay, so integrals also is not something that can be claimed by either Newton or Leibniz. How about transcendental numbers? Well, they're, have, they're going back to antiquity again. People knew about pi, right? Archimedes had a, had a way to estimate pi as we showed uh, in, in an earlier lecture. And a lot of work had been done to get better estimates or to get infinite series or products that, uh, that approach the value of pi. And there's a famous product here given from uh, John Wallace in 1656, where you have an estimate for pi over four uh, by products of two over one times two over three. Basically, you take even integers in the, in the numerator, and then you take the odd integer on either side in the denominator. And the, this sequence of, produ of, of products, partial products, approaches pi over 4. So plenty of work was being done on these uh, on pi. Similarly, E, uh, John Napier, uh, who famously in the early part of the 17th century, 
computed a book on, or he wrote a book on logarithms and computed logarithm tables, which uh, also included E. Uh, but the, the first person to really call attention to E as an important constant was uh, Jacob Bernoulli in 1683, who formulated it in terms of the limit as n approaches to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n. Again, where the, the uh, rigorous definition of limit is not, is not uh, made until later. But um, neither Newton nor Leibniz could be given credit for starting to work with E. And finally, infinite series we mentioned as, a, as an important component of the calculus. And we saw infinite series um, had been used for a while. We saw how Madava derived the series for sine. Uh, James Gregory, the Scottish mathematician, came up with a series expression for arctan. And Nicholas Mercator uh, came up with a, uh, a, an expression, a series expression for log 1 plus x. Note this is not the not the uh, Mercator of the Mercator projection, it's a different Mercator. That was uh, Gerard, I think. Um, but you have a bunch of, of mathematicians already producing infinite series that encoded some function, rational or, or um, transcendental functions. So as we can see, calculus was in the air. Right? There was all of this stuff that people had already done that we think of as calculus. So what did Newton and Leibniz invent? And I found this quote by uh, C.H. Edwards Jr. in the textbook I mentioned earlier to be enlightening. What is involved here is the difference between the mere discovery of an important fact and the recognition that it is important. The contribution of Newton and Leibniz for which they are properly credited as the discoverers, discoverers of the calculus was not merely that they recognized the fundamental theorem of calculus as a mathematical fact, but that they employed it to distill from the rich amalgam of earlier infinitesimal techniques a powerful algorithmic instrument for systematic calculation. Okay, so it's not just coming up with an idea here, a tool there, a fresh, a fresh fact, that, that wasn't what it was about. It was about recognizing that we're working here with a branch of mathematics. We're working here with a new toolbox that people need to start using to do their, their calculations. Okay, so let's go into a closer look at, at Newton's life. Uh, Newton was born in 1642 in England. He became the Lucasian professor in Cambridge in 1669, uh, holding that post until 1701. It's a very prestigious mathematics position. And then he became the warden of the Royal Mint in 1696, a post he held till his death. And in 1703, he became the president of the Royal Society, making him a huge figure in the administration of science in, the, in, in England. In terms of his scientific contributions, he's most famous for uh, formulating the three laws of motion, uh, the law of universal gravitation, his work on optics, which uh, really discovered a lot of the fundamental things that we asso associate with, uh, with light to this day, and, uh, and finally the, his calculus of fluxions. And that was his version of calculus, uh, which we'll go into more on the next slide. So the method of fluxions, it was uh, a text that he wrote in 1666, but it was only published after his death, and that created endless headaches for him and Leibniz later on. So Newton invented calculus in part as a tool to study motion and physics. So variables like x and y were refer referred to as fluence, quantities flowing through time, represented by t, often meant to describe motion of some particle. The time derivatives, or instantaneous velocities, were called fluxions, and they were associated to specific fluence. For instance, to x, we have x dot as a fluxion. To y, we have y dot. Then if we want to take a derivative of a planar curve, where we might think of, well, if y is f of x, then we have dy dx, the derivative that Newton would compute would be written as y dot over x dot. That's the ratio of their fluxions. You're taking the ratio of the change in the y quantity, the fluxion of the y, y fluent, 
to the fluxion of the exfluent. Uh, and in terms of quadrature uh, or integration, if you have a function a of x describing the area under a curve between 0 and x, Newton explained how to find the fluxion a dot associated to the area, then deduce the formula for a of x using antidifferentiation. Uh, and this, is, this was his way of really leveraging the fundamental theorem of calculus as a computational aid. Okay, so that's kind of a, a bird's eye view of what Newton did. Uh, and now we'll, we'll jump into some specific discoveries of Newton. And our, our exposition here is guided by a terrific book, which we'll be following for the rest of the series, called The Calculus Gallery by William Dunham. And, uh, and he starts by diving into one of Newton's earliest discoveries, the generalized binomial series. Let's first recount the formula for 1 plus x to the n, where n is a non-negative integer. So any non-zero quantity raised to the zeroth power is 1. Uh, the first power is just the, the identity map, so that becomes 1 plus x, or 1 times x. Uh, 1 plus x squared becomes 1 plus 2x plus x plus uh, 1 times x squared. Okay. And it's, it becomes obvious that we're looking at the coefficients of the Pascal's triangle of, binomials co of binomial coefficients. Um, and you can build this triangle recursively by taking the previous the terms on the previous row and mapping them down. So you can take a m m n minus one plus a m n. Sorry, but it should be m minus one. And that gives you the formula for the coefficients of these uh, of uh, powers of 1 plus x. But in general, we can write that 1 plus x to the n is given by the sum, as k goes from 0 to n, of n choose k, x to the k, where n choose k is equal to n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial. Okay, and the factorial function is the product of the first, uh, in the the, or rather, m factorial is the product of the first m positive integers. Okay, so this is only, this only really makes sense for uh, non-negative integers. Zero factorial is taken to be one. This only makes sense for non-negative integers. So Newton's innovation was to come up with a generalized formula. Newton introduced the generalized definition as follows. n choose k is going to be given by n times n minus 1 through n minus k plus 1 divided by k factorial. Okay, so it should be pretty clear that when n is an integer, this simplifies to n factorial over k factorial, n minus k factorial. But when n is not an integer, this is also well defined. So let's do an example. Let's say k, well, let's say n is going to be 1 half. Okay, so we're going to be looking at what n choose k is for the first few values of k. So starting with 0, 1, 2, 3. So 0 gives us an empty product on the top because we're taking the 0 largest integers uh, and starting with n and uh, 0 factorial on the bottom. So this is going to be 1. Plugging in k equals 1, we get n over k, n over k which is 
uh, sorry, I, was, I wanted to do minus one half. So that's going to be minus one half. And uh, for k equals two, we have minus a half. And subtracting one, we get minus three halves. So that's positive three quarters divided by two, or three eighths. And then taking uh, k equals three, we have minus a half times minus three halves times minus five halves over three factorial. So that's going to be minus 15 divided by um, three copies of two, or four copies of two times three. So two to the fourth times three, which is minus 15. Uh, actually, let's cancel the threes. So we get minus five divided by 16. Okay, so what this tells us is that that 1 plus x to the minus a half will be given by 1 minus 1 half times x plus 3 eighths times x squared minus 5 sixteenths x cubed, etc. Okay? So that gives us the power to describe a lot more functions, algebraic functions, involving roots, involving uh, polynomial powers in the denominator, uh, as infinite series, which we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So let's consider this uh, this uh, function, 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared, this is very similar to 1 plus x to the minus a half, except you're just replacing 1 plus x, or sorry, 1 plus negative x squared to the minus 1 half. So what we would get here, we would just substitute in negative x squared wherever we see x. So we get 1 plus 1 half x squared Okay, now negative x squared squared is positive x to the fourth. So we have 3 eighths x to the fourth. Okay, how about five, minus 5 sixteenths x cubed? So that becomes minus x squared cubed. So that's, uh, that's uh, minus x to the sixth. So we get positive 5 sixteenths x to the sixth. Okay, um, so this gives us an expression for the series uh, 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, and we're going to take this, that with us. Now let's use what we just computed to find a series expansion for arc sine, the uh, inverse of the sine function. Okay, so as we saw last time, this function 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared is, at least begins in this manner. And let's recall what the integral of this function is. Okay. Um, so this is, is one of the integrals that appears in uh, in, in the tables for students to have on their exam, but if we can do a trig sub to pull it out, let's plug in sine theta and get dx equals cosine theta d theta. Okay, and that becomes the integral of cos theta d theta divided by square root of one minus sine squared theta, okay. So this is obviously cosine theta over the absolute value of cosine theta d theta, but assuming that uh, we're staying somewhat close to the origin, uh, cosine is positive, so we'll take this just to be one. So this is the, uh, the value theta plus constant integration. And since we defined theta to be x equals, to have x equals sine theta, this gives us theta equals arc sine of x. Okay, but that's what we get from 
integrating this series, th this function, as a function. But what happens when we integrate the series? Well, we can integrate the series. So this is uh, using trig sub. But we can also integrate the series term by term. Okay, so that tells us that on the left hand side we'll have the function we just obtained plus, and then on the right hand side we'll get some constant in integration plus x plus one half x squared uh, power rule you get one sixth or uh, yeah let's just make it one sixth one sixth x cubed plus 3 over uh, 40 x to the fifth plus uh, now we need a factor of 7 so 7 times 16 is 112 so we have 5 over 112 x to the seventh etc okay so using standard integration together with Termwise integration on a series, we have a new series expansion for this function. And if you plug in x equals zero, uh, since we're expanding this function around in the neighborhood of zero, this uh, constant of integration can be seen to, to be zero. Okay, so you're just left with x plus one sixth x cubed, etc. Okay. Cool. So we started out by saying that uh, Newton will eventually derive the, uh, the series for sine of x, uh, much as Madhava did at a later point. So how do we get from a series of arc sine to a series for sine? Uh, and that uses a, a process we'll see on the next slide. That's using Newton's tool of inversion of power series functions. Okay, and it goes as follows. So suppose you're given y equals a1x plus a2x squared, etc. And here we're assuming that the constant term is zero, because otherwise this uh, method does not work. Then we want to describe a series expansion for x in terms of b1y plus b2y squared, etc. In terms of y. Okay. And uh, the strategy is relatively straightforward. So we start by truncating and solving only the linear part. So solve the linear part of this equation. So let's call this star for x. Okay, so we'll get a linear expression for x, but obviously that's just an approximation. So then we add an error term. And we sub the result into uh, star. And then we solve the linear part of that equation. to find the, uh, the first term of, of the error part, and to find our next term. Okay, so let's see how this would work for a generic series. So we start with y equals a1x. Well, that means that x is 1 over a1y, okay? Obviously, we truncated, so we're going to add an error term x equals 1 over a1y plus z. Okay, z will be our error term. And plugging that into our function, we have y equals a1 times 1 over a1y plus z. Okay, and we'll take one more term in this expand. Oopsies. One more term. So this will be plus a2 times this squared, plus
plus higher order stuff. Okay, and now the next step will be to oops, will be to take this and simplify it and then find the linear term, the, the linear part of that equation. So we have y equals y plus a1z plus uh, a2 times 1 over a1 squared y squared plus 1, sorry, 2 over a1 y1, sorry, yz plus z squared plus higher order. Okay, continuing to simplify. Uh, we're going to subtract y on both sides, so this is 0. We have a1z plus a2 over a1, a1 squared, y squared, plus 2 over 2a2 over a1, yz, plus a2, z squared etc. Okay, so now we're just interested in the linear part in terms of z. Okay, so linear equation in z. So that means we drop anything that has a z term, a z squared term or higher. So what we get is 0 equals, we'll group all of the z's together and all of the constant terms, or no z terms, and we get a1 plus 2a2 over a1y plus higher order stuff times z plus a2 over a1 squared y squared plus higher order stuff, not times z. And that means that z can be solved for by subtracting the constant term and dividing by the coefficient. So we get minus a2 over a1 squared y squared plus higher order stuff divided by a1 plus 2a2 2a2 over a1, y, etc. And we focus just on the lowest order terms, so we, we're saying that z will be minus a2 divided by a1 cubed y squared plus higher order stuff. And this tells us that using our initial formulation, b2 is going to be minus a2 over a1 cubed um, in terms of our original series. Okay, so that's kind of how you go about this. And then you would go back to your original equation and say, okay, well now I'm going to plug in, let me do that here actually, make myself a bit more room. So then you would plug in our new approximation, x is approximately 1 over a1y minus a2 over a1 cubed y squared plus some new error function, w. Okay, and then you would just repeat. So that's how Newton would invert uh, series functions. Okay, well, let's use that to find our series function for sine x. Going back to this expression, so we have our arc sine, which we got using integration. And we can plug this in here. Okay, we'll delete this zero term. 
and we have this power series. Now we want to use Newton's inversion, series inversion tricks to find an expression for, uh, for the inverse function. So let's call this theta. Okay, and what we're going to be looking for is an expression for x equals sine theta as a power series in theta. So b1 theta plus b2 theta squared, etc. Okay, so if we take, if we label this equation as star and take the linear part, That gives us theta equals x. So that tells us that the first term of our series, b1, equals 1. Now we have x approximated as theta plus an error term. And now we're going to use Newton's trick to plug that back in. So we have theta equals theta plus z plus one-sixth theta plus z cubed plus three-quarters, sorry, three-fortieths theta plus z to the fifth, etc. So if we just take the, uh, the, linear, the linear parts in z, we get theta equals theta plus z plus one-sixth theta, cu theta cubed plus three over six theta squared z, okay, and the linear, the other terms drop out, plus three-fortieths theta to the fifth plus three-eighths theta to the fourth z, okay. So subtracting theta from both sides, we get 0 equals um, 1 plus 3 sixths theta squared plus 3 eighths theta to the fourth and higher order stuff times z plus one-sixth theta cubed plus three-fortieths theta to the fifth and higher order stuff. Okay. So plugging that, so, or solving for z in this equation, we get that z is minus one-sixth theta cubed plus higher order divided by one plus three-sixths theta squared, et cetera, higher order, which we're going to truncate as we did in the, in the example to minus one-sixth theta cubed, okay? And so now we have x is approximately theta minus one-sixth theta cubed plus w, okay? And we'll just do this one last time to get the next term. So we're going to plug this into our expression for arc sine. Okay. So we have theta minus one-sixth theta cubed. On, we have theta on this side, and then we have theta minus one-sixth theta cubed plus w plus one-sixth theta minus one-sixth theta cubed plus w cubed plus three-fortieths theta 
minus one sixth theta cubed plus w to the fifth. Okay. Copying this copying the series to the next slide, we get a bunch of extra stuff, and this should have a five. Um, and we want to simplify this down. And when we do, uh, and I'll spare you uh, some of the algebra, this yields 0 equals 1 plus half theta squared plus 5 twenty-fourths theta to the fourth high order terms times w minus 1 over 120 theta to the fifth plus 1 over 252 theta to the seventh high order terms, which means that w is equal to 1 over 120th theta to the fifth plus high order terms divided by 1 plus high order terms, which means we'll approximate it by 1 over 120th theta to the fifth. Okay, so what we get after computing the next error stat, the next uh, smallest error term, is an additional term of x equals theta minus one sixth theta cubed plus one over one twenty theta to the fifth. Okay, and doing additional computations you'll eventually be able to see that what we're looking at is uh, negative 1 to the k, theta to the k, divided by k factorial, where k goes from uh, 0. Sorry, this should be uh, odd. You'll see eventually that we get the sum of minus 1 to the k, uh, starting with k equals 0 of x to the 2k plus 1 divided by 2k plus 1 factorial. And this goes up to infinity. And this is our expansion for sine theta. Again, arriving at that by starting with the generalized binomial theorem, finding the series for arc sine, and inverting the series. Um, so hopefully this gives you a flavor of Newton for just the computational genius that he was and the creative genius that he was applying all sorts of techniques, all sorts of tools, throwing them at a problem and uh, seeing what popped out. Uh, so in conclusion, Newton and Leibniz, uh, they both came from a rich atmosphere of calculus type math going back hundreds of years. But they were the first to systematize calculus as a toolbox for research. Uh, and as a flavor of his concrete research output, Newton introduced generalized binomial series, which he used to produce a series for sine x. Okay, and in the next lecture, we'll see Leibniz. Thanks so much for your attention.